This is the Best Health Podcast, brought to you by Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist in partnership with MedCost. Good day. Welcome back to the latest Best Health Podcast episode. It's a service of Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist. Justin Gomez here and very glad and appreciative that you are listening to this podcast. As usual, we try and bring relevant and helpful information, resources, um, tips, advice from our local experts that we are so fortunate to have here as part of our health system, both at Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, and Brenner Children's. Um, so speaking of Brenner Children's, and we have uh, Dr. Nicolotti, Dr. Linda Nicolotti, joining us once again for another very important topic that we're going to be getting into and spending some time today, um, suicide awareness and suicide prevention. And so excited to have Dr. Nicolotti talking to us about this subject um, for a number of reasons. It's always good to raise awareness, but, you know, also just to help, you know, there's there's maybe some sort of old school stigmatism uh, or stigma to to looking at, you know, not talking about mental health or you just try and deal with it by yourself. Well, Dr. Nicolotti is going to talk and give us some great uh, insights onto um, busting that myth wide open. So um, as a reminder, she is the section head in pediatrics of pediatric psychology and behavioral health here with Brenner Children's and Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist. Dr. Nicolotti, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we're we're um, glad that you're becoming a quasi-regular on the podcast series. Thanks for having me. And, and I'm glad to be talking about this topic. I think it's an important topic that many people might be interested in, in hearing more about. Dr. Scoggin, who is another clinical provider with our system, you know, he's, I've heard him say more than once that, you know, there's going to be almost a, a second, for lack of a better term, pandemic behind mm-hmm. COVID is, 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 kind of the the increased stress and, and mental health strain um, with people just because we've we've just been through an unprecedented year and a half, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The the second pandemic is the the mental health one. Yeah. Well, um, you have a lot of um, good information to share, I'm sure. So I'm gonna dive right in to um, you know, I'm there's you know, whole courses on this and, and books written about suicide and, and depression. And, um, you know, just to, I guess, start off with helping us understand, you know, you know, maybe it's easier for some people to understand how someone can get to a place where they're thinking about taking their own life than others. Some people might be like, how could you do that? And some people are like, oh, yeah, I could definitely relate to that. So maybe just start off by by talking to us a little bit about depression and and symptoms Mm -hmm. of depression, as as that is often a lead into to that, just to help bring additional awareness around um, suicide prevention, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think when you're talking about um, factors that could contribute to suicide, it is important to take a look at depression and be aware of some of the symptoms of depression. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, those include mood symptoms. So teens and, and others who are depressed, um, you might see more sadness, more irritability or anger. Um, you might notice them being more tearful, crying more often. Um, maybe they don't even seem like they're happy or have the ability to feel happy. You might also notice decreased motivation, decreased interest in doing activities, or even an inability to enjoy themselves anymore. So they might not be interested in seeing friends or participating in some of their extracurricular activities or interests. Um, they might not want to go out, they may not be doing homework, those kind of symptoms. You might notice that they want to be alone more often, they're withdrawing, not really wanting to spend time with friends and family. Mm -hmm. Um, Parents might also notice sleep changes. So either excessive sleep, sleeping too much, you know, trouble waking up in the morning, 
are sleeping all day um, or inability to sleep uh, or getting less sleep. And then also that goes along with that is feelings of tiredness during the mm -hmm. day, low energy, fatigue. Um, you might also notice appetite changes. So you may mm -hmm. notice eating more, like being more hungry or eating excessively or the opposite, really not being hungry, you know, a loss of appetite, getting full faster, um, weight loss corresponding with eating less or weight gain corresponding with eating more. Um, they may report or you may notice restless behavior, you know, their body might seem either really slowed down or really sped up. There could be trouble mm. with concentration, a hard time making decisions. Also feelings of hopelessness, like things will not get better, nothing will help. Feelings of low self-esteem, so they might make comments, you know, about that. Um, they might feel worthless. Also guilt is a common feeling when someone's depressed. And then something really to pay attention to are thoughts of death or suicide. So any comments around that um, would be cause for concern. Um, some teens will also engage in self-harming behaviors such as cutting that can also be a sign of depression. Gotcha. That's that's a lot. That's a that's a lot to keep an eye out for. But and you know, I'm I'm assuming you know some each person is different, so they might be exhibiting some behaviors or symptoms while not exhibiting others. It's it's probably a little different for each person, right? Right. So if somebody is depressed, they may not be experiencing all of these symptoms. Um, they probably will be experiencing some change in mood. So either mm -hmm. you know more sadness or irritability mm -hmm. and then a handful of the other symptoms as well gotcha uh you know you brought up someone at some point mentioning suicide you know that they say something about suicide refer to it or, or hurting themselves possibly and i want to get mm -hmm. into some of the i guess signs and symptoms uh or for lack of a better word risk factors that a teen, adolescence, or a teen might uh, display um, if if they maybe are having suicidal thoughts, because someone might be expressing these thoughts, but someone might be keeping them to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, so a lot of times, teens aren't going to, um, you know, at least tell parents about it. Um, but most of the time, when when a teen is experiencing suicidal thoughts, at least. 50% of the time, but even more than that, um, usually they're reaching out in some way and letting people know how they're okay. feeling. So mm -hmm. it's important to pay attention to, to any of those signs or communications. Um, but some of the risk factors, like we said, depression could be a risk factor, but also use of substances can be a risk factor. Um, mm -hmm you know, that can increase um, impulsivity or, um, you know, just contribute to those type of behaviors. Being involved in bullying, so oftentimes victims of bullying, but even those who bully are at higher risk. Um, a big risk factor is prior suicidal behavior. So if you've had a teen that has made a suicide attempt before, Mm -hmm. um, they may be more at risk to try that again. Mm -hmm. Self-harm behavior, you know, could also be a risk factor. Not everyone who engages in self-harm behavior is doing it with the intent to um, kill themselves. Sometimes, a lot of times, they're doing it to relieve stress. But it can be one of those risk factors that's important to be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, family or other type of interpersonal stressors. So a significant and stressful change, um, loss of a family member, family conflict, mm. parental, you know, divorce, um, any significant life changes um, 
for some for some teens can contribute to thoughts of self-harm and be a risk for that, particularly if they're depressed as well. Um, mm. Also something to really look for, which we've talked about is statements about not wanting to live. So mm. any communication to that effect, parents and caregivers should take that very seriously. So some of these statements can be more direct, such as, you know, I want to die, I'm going to kill myself. Um, that might not be stated to a parent, it might be stated to a friend. Mm -hmm. But also indirect type of statements, such as things like, you know, I can't go on, I want all of this to end, I want to go to sleep and never wake up, things might be better if I'm gone, no mm -hmm. one will miss me anyway. So any of those kind of statements should be taken really seriously as well. Mm. Also, some teens are going to express themselves through creative writing and artwork. So, you know, mm. perhaps even a teacher, um, you know, may be the first one to get a communication like that. And that should be taken seriously as well. Mm -hmm. um, if a teen is expressing, you know, hopelessness or helplessness, helplessness, you know, feeling nothing's ever going to work out. This is never going to get better. Nothing can help me. Those are concerning statements. Um, having a plan to commit suicide, especially a detailed plan, um, places the teen at higher risk for self-harm. Mm -hmm. So it's important if you, if you are concerned that someone is having thoughts of self-harm, that you ask them, you know, do you have a plan? Have you thought about how you might hurt yourself? Um, and with a plan, it's especially concerning. Um, any type of suicide notes or posts are also particularly concerning. Um, risky and dangerous behavior, you know, that reflect a lack of regard for themselves or their own safety can be particularly um, a risk factor as well. So if, mm -hmm, yeah, I mean, it's not always a sign that a teen is suicidal, but if a teen doesn't have regard for themselves or their safety, they're not taking care of themselves. If they're, you know, engaging in reckless behavior, speeding excessively, um, getting into car accidents, um, you yeah. know, abuse of drugs and alcohol, that could be a sign that they're dealing with suicidal thoughts. So that's something to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, any actions indicating closure or saying goodbye. So if they're, you know, writing goodbye notes to people um, giving away their possessions, deleting social media accounts, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. That's something to pay attention to as well. Yeah, I've definitely heard that specific one about giving away their possessions. I've definitely heard that one before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, you know, Dr. Nicolotti, and, you know, I hope parents are listening, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, you know, everyone needs to to be on the lookout for the people in, in your circle, your family, friends. Um, so please, please take what Dr. Nicolotti is saying and, and store that in, in somewhere in your brain where you can recall it if you need to. Um, you know, oftentimes, I, I think it's oftentimes, or it seems that way on media anyways, Dr. Nicolotti, we have, you know, there's this either in the news or social media or even in, you know, TV shows or movies, you know, if, if a suicide occurs sometimes or oftentimes you hear, oh, I'm, I'm so surprised, I'm shocked. I, I never would have thought, you know, they would have done that. I, I didn't know, you know, they were, we were, they were struggling with anything. So, you know, oftentimes it's kind of expressed as, as shock by people that are left behind their family and their friends. And, you know, I, I guess that begs the question, why there are people, I think, oftentimes try and deal with this. They try, if they're depressed or have some sort of other issue they're, they're dealing with or working, trying to work through, they don't feel comfortable enough to, to talk up and say, you know what, I need help or I'm going to get some help. I can't do this on my own. 
you know, I need some guidance here. But they often try and carry that burden and not really share it with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess that, you know, that maybe goes back to this old school stigma of, of you know, it's not, we, we shouldn't talk about mental health or, you know, people are going to think I'm quote unquote crazy. You know, can you talk to us a little bit about that? You know, I'm sure that, you know, you, you've come across that in your professional career uh, thus far. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there's still a lot of stigma out there about talking about mental health and getting mental health services. So even though, you know, I noticed that it's, um, there's, there's more going on in the media that's bringing attention to mental health, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, you hear some famous people, actors, um, talking about their struggles with mental health or athletes, you know, we had talking about this, um, during the Olympics. So I yes. think they're, they're bringing this to, um, into awareness and into people's attention. I think that really helps, but I still think there's, there's a great degree of, um, embarrassment and stigmatization and fear around, um, acknowledging, talking about, you know, mental health struggles and seeking out supports when necessary. Yeah, that's, you know, I hope that people take that to heart. You know, if, if someone listening is, is dealing with depression or other issue or someone that, you know, you know, a a child or niece or nephew might be dealing with depression or, or, or similar issue that, you know, this is, encouraging encouraging people that it's okay to to talk about it and to seek help and and to bring it into the light i think is is a good mm-hmm. a good way that we can all help out each other yeah and and depression you know anxiety other type of um issues that are thought of as mental health issues they're, they're physical issues Um, And so if people can start thinking about them more like a medical issue, you know, is that there are symptoms and there are treatments and there are providers who can help. And, you know, if, if you have um, a medical issue, you're going to most likely go to your doctor and the same with, you know, with any of these mental health issues, it's good to talk about it, seek out supports when needed. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. You know, th- this, I can imagine that this would not be an easy topic. Suicide uh, would not be an easy topic to necessarily bring up and, and have a discussion with your, your tween or your teenager. Um, you know, it seems like a really heavy topic, right? So, you know, you want to talk about their ball practice or their recital or going to grandma's house this weekend, but, you know, how how as parents can we um, talk to our our teenager or tween about suicide in an effective way, but also not just you know completely overwhelming at the same time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it may not be you know what people think of as as conversation to have around the dinner table. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I do think it's really important for parents and caregivers to find ways to bring this up um, to their adolescents and teens, especially, um, you know, find the right time. So you can use openings such as uh, you had mentioned, you know, sometimes um, we hear about things in the media um, or on a TV show or series. Um, parents can use those kind of opportunities and openings to talk about um, mental health and particularly suicide. Um, if the teen, you know, has mentioned that maybe they have a friend they're worried about or who is dealing with depression, that's also an opening to bring up the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and particularly if a teen is struggling with um, depression or other risk factors, it's important for parents and caregivers to find ways to bring this up as well. So I would say, you know, to, to parents and caregivers, um, don't be afraid to bring up the topic with your teen. You know, it, it might feel uncomfortable to talk about it, but 
-hmm. it is a good and healthy topic to bring up. Um, even if your team's teen seems really well adjusted, it can still be helpful to bring this up because it's likely that your teen has been exposed in some way, you know, to someone um, expressing thoughts of self harm. So it might be a peer, you know, it might be somebody they've heard about, it might be a friend, um, but it might even be them. Um, and even hearing about, you know, someone else that committed suicide or is thinking about um, taking their own life can mm -hmm. be very distressing to teens. Um, you know, in addition, when a parent or caregiver brings it up, it lets the teen know that they have permission to talk about this topic and it's not taboo in the home yes. or with the parents, which is mm -hmm. really important. Um, and they can ask questions such as, you know, what have you heard about suicide? Um, or I've heard of a recent death of a, a local teenager. You know, what have you heard about this? Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone who's expressed any thoughts of hurting themselves? Um, have you ever worried about someone? You know, have you thought about what you would do if you hear of a peer or a friend who's expressing these kind of thoughts to you? Um, and then I think it's important for parents and caregivers to also address that, you know, if their own teen ever has thoughts of harming themselves, you know, parents can let them know that they want them to come talk to the parent. You know, mm -hmm. give them permission. Um, I want to be helpful to you if you ever experience this. And you may never experience this, but if you do, I want you to know I'm here for you. I want you to tell me what's going on so we can figure out the best way to get you help for this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really an opportunity and a chance to provide some education and, and open up the conversation. Um, and so this is especially important if a parent does have concerns about their own teen um, being mm -hmm. depressed or potentially having any kind of thoughts of self-harm. Um, and if a teen is willing to talk, you can let the teen guide the conversation. Um, but some teens are not going to want to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. And you also want to remain calm non-judgmental, non-reactive. You want to create a space to listen, um, not giving advice, being honest. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, that that's actually, I, I like that, the last part you were talking about that, you know, I think I find myself as a parent or even as a spouse, you know, I just want to someone expresses something like I automatically just want to go in and fix it. Right. I want to, you know, mm -hmm. well, if we do this, this, and this, it's better. And, you know, sometimes that's not what people are looking for. They're just looking for um, a good listening, compassionate ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of us have a tendency to, to want to be fixers. You know, we, we want to help, we want to do something. Um, but it's also important to realize that listening is sometimes the most helpful thing. Creating mm -hmm. that space is sometimes the most helpful thing for your teenager. Mm -hmm. So I guess to, to follow up on that, if you have a conversation with your teen or maybe you haven't had a sit down conversation yet, but your teen, you know, starts making some of these statements that you mentioned closer to the top of the podcast of, you know, no one would miss me if I'm gone, or I just, I don't feel like being here anymore. Whatever concerning statement they make, some sort of suicidal thought that they express, I'm sure that can be uh, scary or, or shocking for, for parents. Mm -hmm. um, what are some steps that the, the caregiver or the parent can, can take to keep their, their child safe? Yeah, this, this is really important. Um... So we discussed encouraging your teen to talk to you about his or her feelings and creating that space um, and being non-judgmental when they're talking to you. Um, if you are concerned 
that they're at risk to harm themselves. You want to get them to a mental health professional for an urgent evaluation and assistance as soon as possible um, in order to keep them safe and get them appropriate treatment. Um, if your teen seems to be in imminent danger of self-harm, mm -hmm. you don't want to leave them alone. You know, it's not mm -hmm. good to isolate when you're having thoughts of self-harm. Mm -hmm. um, also, some other options are, are taking him or her to the emergency department. They have resources there. Um, mm -hmm. I know Brenner Children's has resources there to help teens and families or a parent can call 911. Mm -hmm. um, there's also mobile crisis um, through DHHS that can come to your home within a few hours and do evaluations. In addition, there are some crisis centers in our community that have walk-in hours. Um, they're, they're usually regular business hours though. So I think if it's really urgent, you know, you, you want to do something immediately like calling 911 or go to the emergency department. If it's a situation that could potentially wait a few hours, you could make use of a walk-in clinic or calling mobile crisis. Um, Another important thing to do is limit access to any type of lethal means that a teen might use to harm themselves. Mm -hmm. So firearms are the most lethal um, means of self-harm. So if there are firearms in the home, you want to make sure that the teen does not have access to them. They're, you know, locked and secured. Um, also, any kind of prescription medications that might mm. be used for an overdose or even over-the-counter medications, you mm. know, it's probably a good idea to remove those mm. um, from access for the time being. And mm -hmm. then any other, you know, if they've expressed a particular thought they're having about hurting themselves, you, you want to remove any kind of um, means that a teen could use to harm themselves during that time. Um, it's also important to discuss helpful ways to cope when your teen is experiencing thoughts of self-harm. Mm -hmm. So explore what could help them feel better. So again, you want to discourage them from isolating or don't let them isolate. Spend time with family members or even a, a family pet can be comforting. Talk to a friend, take a walk you know, do things like listening to music, art, drawing, writing, journaling, um, engaging in a relaxing or distracting activity could be helpful in the moment. Um, and discuss with them that it's really important that they do communicate with you whenever they're experiencing thoughts of self-harm, you know, to let you know so yeah. that you can help keep them safe during that time. I mean, the caregivers and adults are usually the ones at home with their teens, oftentimes when these thoughts are happening. And so it's important that the teen lets you in so mm -hmm. that you can help keep them safe during those times. And I know that can be hard for some teens. They don't necessarily want to tell a parent about these kind of thoughts or want to tell a pa parent when they're having these kind of thoughts. Um, but it's important to try to open up that, that communication um, so that they can be safe during these times. Um, you know, just let them know you're there for them. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to be alone during these times. Um, and then, you know, it's important to establish ongoing counseling if a teen's dealing with some thoughts of self-harm or depression. Um, it's important to find a counselor your, your teen likes, you know, they feel comfortable with, they, they trust. Yes. Um, that relationship can become really important. So you can be an advocate for them in that respect. Um, another yes. thing is that, you know, it may be a good idea to alert the school counselor about what's going on so your teen can more readily get support at school. Yes. Um, I think it's important, you know, some teens might be uncomfortable with that, but um, I would definitely say, you know, let your teen know and, and discuss that with your teen. But in general, I really think that's a good idea. And then finally, 
you know, some teens will also benefit from medication to manage um, depression symptoms that might mm -hmm. be contributing to thoughts of self-harm. And mm -hmm. you can always discuss that with a counselor um, or your primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of lots of great information there, Dr. Nicolotti. So, you know, we just talked about your own child um, that, you know, is, is with you in, in your home. But, you know, I think this is a good, I guess, follow up question. What if your your tween or your teen, you know, comes home from school or from ball practice or what have you and says, you know, hey, you know, so and so one of their good friends or friends says, you know, he's been kind of down lately or, or, you know, he said something that, you know, is kind of weird. It was unusual that, you know, something, something, you know, referring to taking their life or suicide. Um, what, mm -hmm. what can we do if one of our, our kids, our children are, is concerned that one of their friends is, is might be getting ready to hurt themselves in some way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is so important. Um, I think many teens these days are dealing with this question, um, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to talk with your teen about what they can do if they ever find themselves in that situation. Uh, so it's, it's important for your teen to just be aware of the warning signs that we discussed previously and some of the risk factors that they can be looking for you know, if, if their friend is depressed or their friend has been a victim of bullying or, you know, having um, family stressors at home. Encourage your teen to talk to his or her friend and listen to their feelings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's okay to, to be there for their friend, be a good listener. Um, some of the same strategies that parents use with their kids in this situation, you know, your teen can use with a friend. Um, you know, your teen can let their friend know that they're important, they're loved, they would be missed, you know, really um, saying things that can be helpful but they should really take any threats of self-harm or intent to, um, you know, harm themselves very seriously. And they really shouldn't keep any secrets. So, you know, a friend may ask your teen not to tell anybody, um, right. but, you know, encourage your teen not to make any promises to that effect, you know, they, they want to be there to support their friend, but they also want their friend to be safe. Right. Um, you know, encourage them not to leave a friend alone if they're concerned that the friend is in imminent danger of self harm. Um, so that the same advice applies. Um, it's not good to be alone. And as soon as possible, tell a trusted adult about the concerns, you know, don't keep the secret, don't try to handle it on your own, you know, so, so peers go to each other, friends go to each other oftentimes mm -hmm. before they go to parents. Um, yep. But, but it's a huge burden for your teen to be hearing this type of information from a friend and feeling responsible for their friend. So you don't want your teen to deal with that by themselves, you know, encourage them to tell you, tell other trusted adults as soon as possible so that they can get the friend help. Um, so it's, it is really stressful and your teen might benefit from some extra support or even counseling around this. Mm -hmm. If they have a friend who's been, you know, depressed or having thoughts of self-harm or who has made a suicide attempt, um, you know, giving them support so that they can deal with that as well. Yeah, you know, that's, that's all great information. I think that it's, um, you know, the communication, you know, from, from what you're saying, communication is key, you know, bring bringing things into the light, it's, you know, it's, if someone is struggling, you know, it's okay to talk to someone else. It's okay to get mm -hmm. help. It's okay to, to be in counseling. It's okay to see a therapist. It's not only okay, it's, it's good. It's, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, unfortunately, 
um, everywhere, you know, including our own community, there, there we we do have suicides in our community, and um, there are people that are, um, you know, friends or family of the person who takes their life. You know, God forbid if if one of my you know kids' friends take their life and commit suicide. You know that can be very heavy um, for for my for my child if they were a good friend or even a friend. Um, mm-hmm. What what can I do to help my teen cope uh, if they lose a friend or a peer as a result of suicide? Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, this this can be a very real situation. Um, so, you know, communication, like you said, is is very important. Um, parents and caregivers also want to acknowledge that teens are going to experience a real range of emotions in response to a loss, um, especially a loss of of a close friend, but but even a peer who they've had more of a distant relationship with. Mm-hmm. You know, there can be a range of feelings, numbness, sadness, you know, anger that this happened, confusion about why did this happen? And, you know, I, I just saw my friend last week and everything seemed fine. They may end up feeling really lonely or even guilty that they didn't do something um, or do more um, that might have prevented this. Mm-hmm. So um, it's it's okay, it's normal to have a range of feelings. And so, um, you know, encouraging your your teen to, to express their feelings is important and have outlets for those feelings. Um, but parents should be aware that there's no right way for their teen to grieve and go through this process. You know, everybody has their own path um, when they've lost someone they love. Mm-hmm. And, um, they have different timelines um, as well. So it's important to recognize that and to let your teen know that too, that there's no right way to do this. Um, You know, it's important to have ways to deal with your feelings and express your feelings, but there's no right way or right order to go through this process. Um, It's not a one size fits all type of situation. Um, yep. As comfortable, you know, you, you want to encourage your teen and, and again, create that space for them to talk about their feelings, um, to talk about the person that they lost. Um, but talk to them about, you know, explore with them what are some ways you can get your feelings out. You know, talking is one way, but not everybody likes talking about their feelings or is ready to do that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, explore other ways. Um, journaling, you know, might appeal to some teens. Music is a great outlet. Art, you know, dance, um, make a TikTok video, you know, post. There, there are different ways that teens can get their feelings out and express themselves. And that's going to be individual, you know, just based on the teen's personality and interest and mm-hmm. Um, ways of of coping. So explore with them and encourage them to engage in those activities. That's really important. Um, But yet create openings to talk with you that are ongoing. You know, a teen might not be ready to talk now, but maybe they'll want to talk later or maybe when you least expect it. Um, You can ask some questions if your teen's receptive to it, such as, you know, what are some good times that you shared with your friend? You know, what mm-hmm. were they like? Um, tell me about their sense of humor, or their personality, or, you know, show me some some pictures that you have of your friend. Um, check in with your teen periodically. Ask how they're doing, you know, how they're managing, how they've been coping. What are they doing to cope? Um But try not to give unsolicited advice because it doesn't usually appeal to teens and that might Mm -hmm. make them distance from you more. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you're a teen, a lot of teens don't want to talk to their parents. Um, Maybe, though, they'd be comfortable talking to another trusted adult, such as a pastor 
or a counselor or, you know, another um, a family member or friend of the family. So encourage your teen to do that if they don't want to talk to you, explore with them options for that. And, you know, sometimes a teen doesn't want to talk, but they might appreciate you being with them in the silence. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for parents to recognize that too. You know, yeah. just because their teen doesn't want to talk doesn't necessarily mean their teen doesn't want them there. You know, so sometimes yeah. just being with someone um, is very helpful. That's good. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's that's a good point. Yeah. And, um, you know, you want to encourage them to spend time with friends. Um, mm -hmm. That's really important. I mean, I think other important things during this time is... Um, encouraging them to have a schedule and a routine um, to just try to stay involved in their regular activities. You know, I mean, they, they may need a break initially, but you want to mm -hmm. get them back into those things. Um, mm -hmm. And really important is, is trying to take care of themselves. So a lot of teens might experience some sleep difficulties, especially after losing a friend. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they might not eat well, you know, their stomach might be upset, they might not feel hungry. But um, it's, it's important to continue to engage in these self care activities, um, and getting exercise and, you know, socializing, all of those things can be really important in coping and healing. Um, gotcha. Another, yeah, there's, there's a lot here. Um, Parents can be on the lookout for any unhealthy behaviors or ways of coping because some teens might resort to, you know, risk taking or, or unhelpful behaviors. Um, and, you know, you, you want to redirect them if they're doing that or potentially get them professional help. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think honoring the friend who died can be a helpful part of the grieving process. Sure. Um, you know, if possible. They may be able to go to a memorial service or a wake or have, you know, participate in some kind of ritual to um, acknowledge um, and help them grieve the loss of their friend. Mm -hmm. um, they may do things also like, you know, keeping a, a memory journal or a collection of photos or other mementos um, that can be helpful over time. So you can discuss those options with your teen as well. Okay. You know, um, we've been talking a lot about just the, I guess, I don't know how, how you're a professional. I don't know how you would categorize it, but in my mind, it's kind of like internal. So like my personality, the chemical makeup of my brain is going to determine how I deal, cope with, with stress or depression or, or grief. But there are, you know, external factors, you have cultural um, issues or factors or environmental uh, factors that are, um, could be Im impacting how someone, especially, you know, a younger person um, can cope with, with suicidal thoughts and, and grief. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there's probably a lot we can talk about here, but if you wouldn't mind just briefly touching on this um, topic, I, I think it. I think it could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Justin, this is such an important question and topic. Um, and it, it could be its own podcast um, or even beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are books on this topic. But I, I do think it's important to recognize um, cultural and religious factors, um, you know, in addition to um, individual personal factors that can affect how someone um, deals with grief, you know, how someone might deal with um, suicidal thoughts even or depression. So I think just knowing that there are various factors out there um, that affect precipitants of suicidal behavior, so things that um, could contribute to to um, someone feeling suicidal, feeling like harming themselves, 
or even how they might harm themselves or acting on those thoughts. Um, there are cultural factors related to um, risk um, factors for self-harm as well as protective factors for self-harm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even cultural and religious factors related to the acceptability of having thoughts of self-harm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's important to recognize that when people do have thoughts of self-harm, they don't want those thoughts you know they're not um intentionally having those thoughts those thoughts are are there um mm -hmm. and oftentimes beyond the person's control in the moment and so um but i, I do think it's important to recognize that um you know there are certain religions for example that um in which you know suicide is is not acceptable Mm -hmm. um or considered a serious sin or um cultures in which you know don't really acknowledge suicide um or acknowledge the need for mental health or, or um you know that type of vulnerability so um you know i think all of those things are important to keep in mind um you know also these kind of factors can contribute to feeling more stigma or embarrassment, you know, mm -hmm. around talking about um, mm -hmm. your symptoms and your thoughts and struggles. Um, and, you know, for some teens, there might be a mismatch between um, how they um, feel they need to cope with the situation and how their parents or caregivers may um, cope with the situation given you know cultural and uh, cultural factors and religious beliefs um, so i think it's important for caregivers and parents to just be aware of some of these factors and um, you know which which can be difficult to overcome i think if it is a barrier but mm -hmm. um, i i think again encouraging your your teen to talk to you um, to open up communication is so important and ask your teen what what do you need you know maybe mm. talk about some of the differences that uh, that you might be um experiencing in terms of how you view um depression and self-harm and how they view depression and self-harm gotcha. um see if you can open up that type of conversation and um that might make it more likely that your teen will talk to you okay so you know we're getting ready to wrap up we've been talking with dr linda N nicolotti she's our section head for pediatric psychology and behavioral health here with Vernon children's and, and atrium health lake forest baptist but we do not we do not want to leave or in this podcast without reiterating um, resources are available, you know, that um, there are different types of resources that, that you as a parent can access, that um, a, a, an adolescent or a teenager can access. And we, we want to definitely communicate that across, you know, if, if your child says, you know, it is dealing with suicidal thoughts, it's, it's this, you know, it can be a very scary mountain as the parent for you to have to think you're climbing but there, there's, there's definitely help here in our own community. Um, so we want to help get the word out about some of the resources that are available, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so important. Um, so um, there, there are crisis phone numbers. Uh, one of them is the 1-800-273-8255. Um, also, there's a text line, um, texting HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741. Hmm. There are a lot of websites that have helpful information as well. So there's the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Mm -hmm. um, the American Psychological Association has some helpful resources as well. And then um, the National Association of School Psychologists has really helpful handouts. Um, supporting students at school and at home around some of these issues. 
Gotcha. Yeah, you know, and then we, I want to mention again that um, we have a webpage, wakehealth.edu slash coping with stress has a lot of helpful resources on there, including links and phone numbers. Um, I know, you know, our own behavioral staff is, is available at our hospitals and um, outpatient clinics and you know, CareNet is available, another good service here in our in our area. Um, you know, but like you mentioned before, if if you're a parent or, or caregiver and you're in a, an acute situation where you think, you know, um, harm is is imminent or could be imminent, imminent, don't, you know, I think some people are are afraid in some ways to call 911 or to go to the emergency department, but those are resources that are there. For our community and to help people they're there for a reason so mm -hmm. yeah I mean I think the most important thing to keep in mind in in those kind of situations is that your child's your teen's safety is the most important thing right and um, you need to do all that you can to keep them safe and make sure that they're safe yes yes that is at the end of the day, that is what is the most important for sure. Make like their their they're safe and and you know get them on the road to to being as healthy as they can be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dr. Nicolotti, thank you so much for taking the time again to to talk with us about um, suicide awareness um, resources, suicide prevention. This has been extremely helpful. Um, people listening, thank you for taking the time to listen to this really useful information. Please share it if you have found it useful with with a uh, with your child, with a friend, with a family member. Um, just the more awareness and and the more conversation we can have around this topic, I think, um, can be helpful for for our whole community. So, I appreciate your time, Doctor. You're welcome, Justin. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, and like I said last time, I'm going to end the podcast with with please be kind, be kind to each other. And until we talk again, please be well. You've been listening to the Best Health Podcast, brought to you by Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist.